Anything else? We're going to get into our series on hope, right? Hope. Hope is not what you're going to find if you listen to all of the multitude of voices out there. And I think that if we're in recovery and we read the literature, hope is not even going to be found in the fact that we stop using drugs. I think that hope is going to be found in the recovery that's talked about in the literature of recovery. And I think that only happens as we jump into our second and third and eleventh and twelfth step. At least that's the way I read the literature. Hope's not going to be found in me. And I can't put my hope in you, but I can put my hope in the God that is um, my creator, my truth, the love of my life. And so with that said, we're going to go ahead and, uh, and jump into our, uh, our scriptures in the letter of, uh, of First Peter here. And so, um, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. You don't want last. You don't want the, the sermon from last week's notes. I don't think you can get those online. By the way, if you go uh, online and you go to our website, you can listen to all of our past sermons. We had Pastor Mark Rich here, Pastor Raymond Ramos, somebody else I forget who, and uh, oh, from San Francisco, uh, San Jose. Who is it? Darryl. Pastor Daryl, great preacher. And so you can go on there, or if you know of a friend who's lost, maybe you sponsor somebody, say, I want to know who God really is. I can't go back to where I came from. Please be honest with me. Don't tell me that God is whatever I can make Him to be. I want to know who God really is. You can tell Him, go to this website, listen to some of the sermons, and get back to me. Tell me what you think, right? That's part of the reason they're there. So, getting into our, our scripture now. A little bit of background again. At this time in history, when Peter writes this letter, a man who had walked with Jesus Christ for three years, a man who had become very familiar with Old Testament scriptures, right? A man who, when he was writing this, he looked back, right, at historical facts. He looked back at Old Testament scripture. We're 1900 years in front of Peter, and we're looking back to Peter's day now. And in Peter's day, we know from history, not because, this is very important, not because he's going to dissect the problems of his day. He's not going to get, in fact, you would not know the problems of his day unless you got into secular history. And you read about Roman culture and the things that were going on in those days. But it was really, really bad. We're talking about discrimination, persecution, hostility, families being separated, possessions lost or forfeited. And one of the things I was thinking about as I was studying, imagine being a Christian in those days. And then you got people, they're not believers at all, but they're your friends. And then you have other people, they're borderline Christians. Sometimes they come to church, sometimes they don't. You know, last Sunday we had almost 50 people here. A few Sundays prior we had 100 people here. And sometimes it gets very thin. You know, and I wonder, I wonder if the Lord determines who loves Him according to consistency. I'm not saying it happens, I'm saying I wonder. Because I know... One of the reasons I know that my wife loves me is because of her consistency in our relationship. One of, the people, one of the reasons I know that my sponsor and other people love me is because the consistency of my relationship with them. If God is the same way, maybe He counts consistency for something. For something. And I'm not talking about people that go to a lot of churches or whatever, or people that don't call themselves as, uh, you know, members of this church. I'm talking about people that say, Recovery House of Worship Southern California is my church. And we see them here quarterly. <laughs> right? I'm not saying that's fact. I'm just saying that I wonder. But imagine in those days, you have those people. And here come the Roman soldiers by order of Caesar Nero. We talked about the wickedness of this guy. And again, you don't have to look at the Bible. Just look at your history books. The guy was totally twisted. The Bible refers to him as one of the sons of perdition. The only other two men that the Bible calls a son of perdition is the Antichrist and Judas who betrayed Jesus. So if you're in the Bible and there's only three other people that have that title, you're somebody really special in Satan's realm. Right? You're one of his tools for sure. And so these people are living with circumstances like this. And when you're living in circumstances like this, one of the things you experience is this feeling, this gut-wrenching feeling that all worldly hope seems to be lost. 
right? It's that ultimate lie that Amon was talking about. When I was very young, I think I was in my early 20s. I used to use with a guy. His name was Porky. Porky was from Jardim. Porky was in his 80s. He was an old dope fiend. When I talk about knowing dope fiends that were in Folsom in the 40s, he's one of them. And he just used and kept on using. Pepe used to talk about being on that train. And he was willing. He wanted to ride that train to the end. It was all he knew. He's an old jailhouse guy. Finally, his sons, he had like five boys. His sons gaffled them up, put them into some kind of detox, and sent them to the convalescent home. He was in the convalescent home for about three weeks. And Porky made his way up to the roof, jumped off, broke his neck, and killed himself. He believed Satan's ultimate lie. He also believed that hope could only be found in this world, in his case, through heroin. And when that's taken... The mind, the flesh, Satan, the pits of hell says, there's only one thing left to do now, Porky. End it. And so many, I've been clean 27 years. I've seen a lot. And I can't even remember how many drug addicts who said they were in recovery uh, took it to that end. It happens because when our hope is in the world, and the world the, the, the caves in the way it always does. And that's the only hope you have and there's nowhere to go. Says the father of lies, right? So Peter opens his letter with the greatest assurance ever. And if you put on your spiritual mindset, you're going to get this. Okay? He doesn't talk about the details and the circumstances of the day. He talks about the greatest assurance the Christian will ever have. Because he reminds us that we, we talked about it last week, were chosen by God long ago according to God's foreknowledge. God is a forward thinker. He doesn't forget the past, but he knows things that are going to... And one of the things that God knew many, many thousands of years ago was first of all your name. He knew your name. And second, he knew what choice you would make when he would use an individual to introduce you to him, whoever that individual was. He also knew that there were people that no matter what, they were going to reject him. They were going to say, no, no, that religion is truth. That building is truth. This philosophy is truth. He knew that they would go that way. He knew that there were other people like Amen. That when they heard the truth, they would respond in like. And they would pursue loving Him the way He loves us. Right? So, God's foreknowledge. Let me put it another way. For you basketball fans, the Golden State Warriors took the championship a couple of weeks ago, if you don't know. That's right. Right? That's right. <laughs> California. Too. Why? Because California knows basketball better than the best, more than the rest of the country. Right? Don't get your feelings hurt. Just the reality. But with that said, there were a lot of people that put money on the Golden State Warriors. And they're going up against uh, the Cavaliers, man. A tough team. They say that the Cavaliers have one of the greatest basketball players that we're ever going to see. And they took it. Right? So this foreknowledge would be as if though, two or three months ago, I bet Eamon and Jimmy, and then I went to Vegas, and I put money with Javier, and I said, I'm taking the Golden State Warriors. I'll give you 100 to 1. I'm putting $100 in on this thing. 100 to 1, I'll take it. And so now the series is going forward, and, and maybe Kevin Durant or somebody gets, gets hurt, right? Maybe Steph Curry's missing his three-point shots. Whatever the problem is. Am I sitting on the edge of my seat biting my fingernails? Absolutely not. Why? Foreknowledge, baby. I already know the end result. And so this is what God is dealing with. We're not dealing with that. But God is dealing with that. And since God is dealing with that and we're not, we trust Him, don't we? But you're going to trust Him a lot less if you're walking far behind. Some of the reasons, I, I know Amen very well, some of the reasons he knows the stuff he's talking about is because he's not messing around during the day. He's not focused on all kinds of garbage. He's listening to Christian radio. He's reading books. He's studying the Word. He's watching the world and he's making notes and making comparisons. And this is what happens. And you see the truth in a way that very few people see it. And sometimes it's disturbing. Sometimes you can go and even get a little depressed about it. 
But then there's the hope. And this is what Peter uh, is talking about here from the, in the scriptures. So from verses 3 to 12, Peter doesn't dissect or focus on the issues at hand. Peter writes to focus on the assurance and the hope of the promises that we have of God. And those promises are a promise to every single believer for their future. Every single, so if you're part of the Jesus family, listen very closely because Jesus has never lied and he will never lie. This is truth like no other truth. So what happens when bad time comes, we human beings, frail human beings, will drown spiritually, mentally, and emotionally if we focus on those things. That's what happens to those people that believe and go for that ultimate lie. Mature Christians never focus on their problems. Mature Christians never focus on their problems. What they do is they look up, they look ahead at the promises and assurance that God has given them. And you know what that does? That levels out all of the mountains that stand in front of you. They could be big, they could be little, they could be whatever. And it's not that they don't hurt. It's just that our God is so much bigger Right? And our God is working with foreknowledge. He already knows the warriors are going to win. And that's what he's dealing with. Otherwise, what happens is we end up like Peter when he was brand new, when he was a newcomer. Remember what happened to Peter on the Sea of Galilee? It was in Matthew chapter 14. And what happened is the disciples were tired. Jesus was a little tired too. But he had to minister to the people. So when he fed the 5,000, good lesson for those people who want to serve in the church. Right? And, Peter, and Jesus says, you know, you guys are tired. Get into this boat. And he shoved them across and they paddled, they sailed, whatever, to the other side of the Galilee. But when they were in the middle of the sea and Jesus was over here on a hill. If you've ever been to the Sea of Galilee, it's surrounded by hills. And Jesus is on top of one of those hills and he's praying and he's resting. And you know what he sees from the top of the hill? He sees his disciples in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. Now the Sea of Galilee is 8 miles wide and 13 miles long. And it's 141 feet deep. If you guys know anything about the disciples, they're fishermen. They know the Sea of Galilee really, really well. Well, I'm going to tell you that on a windy day, Huntington Beach, the surf capital of the world, has nothing on the waves that are created at the Sea of Galilee. They are big. They will consume you. You say, but it's a lake. Go there. Confirm what I'm telling you. I've seen it. I've been there. There's a restaurant with a big patio on the lake. I mean, a big patio. Once the wind kicks up and the waves start blowing, you can't sit in the patio. You can't even sit inside near the glass because the waves are just crashing down on you. And that's what these guys are facing. And all of a sudden, Jesus, because he is who he is, he comes walking on the water. Calm as ever, right? And they think that it's a ghost. But Jesus says to them in Matthew 24 and Matthew 14, verse 27, he says, Don't be afraid, take courage, I am here. And then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come out to you walking on the water. And Jesus says, Yes, come on. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. He says, you have so little faith. Why did you doubt me? He said, right? So for a moment, Peter experiences this peace and assurance and victory when Jesus said, yeah, come on, right? At that point, Peter is what? Focused on Jesus and the assurance that Jesus spoke. But then at some point, he's back into total fear again. What was the turning point? Verse 30, when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. And Jesus said, why did you doubt me? He took his eyes off of Jesus. I don't know what he was looking at. And when he took his eyes off of Jesus, he forgot the words of Jesus, and down he went. And it wasn't just down. We're talking waves, wind, maybe thunder, maybe rain. I don't know. 
But it's crazy when the Sea of Galilee kicks up. And so spiritually, mentally, and emotionally, Peter almost drowned in his situation. See, it's an illustration. It's a true story, but it's also an illustration of what happens to us when we focus on our problems instead of the Lord, right? So he doubted Jesus. Well, now this same Peter who's writing the letter of 1 Peter... It's been several years, maybe 20, maybe 30 years after Jesus was crucified. Peter is very mature in his faith now, right? And so Peter writes this letter, not detailing all the circumstances of the poor Christians in that day, but with expectation and assurances in God's promise and in the hope that we have if we believe and focus on the promises that God gives us so that we don't drown in our problems, whatever your problems may be. Some of us are suffering from loneliness. Some of us are suffering from inadequacy. Some of us are suffering with sex addiction. We let go of the drugs, but we still can't fill the hole in here. Many of us are suffering from overspending. You know, we're, we're acting out in the mall someplace. I mean, there's a variety of things. And I'm telling you from my experience and the experience of many people that when we leave drugs, or some of us didn't have a problem with drugs, but whenever we have that hole, and after we've been clean six, seven, eight months, we say, wait a minute, I'm clean. The hole still ain't filled. Right? And if we look at the steps, oh my goodness, step two, step three, no wonder. Right? And so... I'm saying, whatever your problem is, we don't have a government that's kicking down the doors of Christians, not yet anyway, right? But whatever your problem is, there's a lot of application for us here. So in verse 3 of of, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 5, this is what Peter writes. And let's pray before we jump in. Father, we ask you for your Holy Spirit here this afternoon. We are not many, Father, but we are among those who said no matter what, I'm going into the house of Lord of the Lord today. And so, Father, we come with expectation and we ask you now to unfold your word in our minds, in our hearts. Saturate us with it. Because your very word says that we cannot take hold of your word without the Holy Spirit. And so we invite the Holy Spirit here in this place and each one of our lives individually. Because we want to get close to you. Some of us are here not knowing. And our question, the, the, uh, that question to you would be, if you're real, reveal yourself. And Lord, nothing new to you. You've heard that one a million and a half times. But if that's their request, then we pray that you would reveal yourself through your word and by whatever means you desire. And for those of us who know you, may you continue to encourage us. May you be even more real in our lives because though we can't see you, we believe. May our lifestyle reflect that. Help us now in Jesus' name. Amen. So Peter writes and he says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by His great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by His power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So the first thing we want to realize here is that if we ever get to the place where we think God is withholding anything from us at a particular time in our life, there's a lot of people that go around believing it. I prayed and I asked God, the reason God's not giving it to you is because you will kill yourself with it. And I'll bet, I'll bet, I'll bet that if we open up your inventory, that's going to be revealed. God already knows. So when we feel that way, that God is withholding something that we know is right, that we know is good for us. Remember Romans chapter 8 verse 32. Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? The answer should be obvious. Of course. Of course. If Chachi says, Mario, I need $10,000, need it desperately, and I give it to her, 
Five days later, she says, Mario, I need a bus token. Can I get another dollar? Am I going to refuse her the dollar after I gave her 10000 Absolutely not. And that's what Jesus is saying. If I gave you what was the most precious thing to me, my son, if I gave that to you, do you think that if you ask me for something that is good for you, that I'm going to withhold it? I don't play hard to get. I don't play games. But I'm out for your best interest. And I'm looking long term. Remember foreknowledge? I'm looking long term. Right? And how about verse 5? Through your faith, God is protecting you by His power. When Peter was sinking into that dark, stormy water, why didn't he drown? Verse 31, Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You know what's incredible about two things? First of all, you can doubt Jesus and He will still save you from sinking. Because our relationship with Jesus Christ is not based on our works or that we become very good people. If that was the case, forget it right now. Pack it up. Put the chairs away. Let's just go home. Our relationship with Jesus Christ is based on the fact that He is good, that He's faithful. He knows we're not. The other thing is, picture this in your mind. What I enjoy sometimes about the Bible is everything that I learn because of what it says. And also what I learn because of what it doesn't say. Give you an example. Peter is sinking. The Bible says Jesus reached out and grabbed him and pulled him up. Picture that in your mind. Do you see Peter's hand around Jesus' wrist? I hope not. Because Jesus didn't reach down and say, Now, Peter, put your hand. Okay, I'm going to pull you up now. Jesus reached down and put his hand around Peter's wrist and pulled him up. Which is exactly what he does with us. This is the picture God wants us to see. Because if that's the case, then you can't drown, can you? My boys, uh, when they were little, and, and Priscilla, if I was walking with them across the street, I never put my hand in their hand. I put, my, I put their hand in my hand. Why? Because if they're holding on to my hand, they might let go, take off running, and the car hit them. You see the picture of assurance that we have. Jesus is very careful with the details. He says, read carefully. Think of this. Let, let my word saturate your mind so that you get the whole picture. Right? Verse 6. So be truly glad that there is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love Him, even though you have never seen Him. Though you do not see Him now, you trust Him, and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting Him will be the salvation of your souls. So the word trials there in verse 6 in the original Greek is lupio. Lupio, L-U-P-E-O. And it refers to sorrow, heaviness, or deep grief. Sorrow, heaviness, or deep grief. Now, the same word is used in Luke chapter 22, verse 45. If you remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was praying and he looked over and the disciples all fell asleep. They were tired, but it was a very demonic, oppressive spirit type of being tired. Because he said, it says in Luke 22 verse 45, At last he stood up, that's Jesus again, and returned to the disciples only to find them asleep, exhausted from grief, lupeo. They experienced tremendous oppression. You ever walk into a room of people who have made it very clear to you, I don't believe in your Jesus, I don't like your Jesus, and we know who you are? It's happened to me many times. They can smile at you, they might even put their hand out to shake your hand or whatever, but you can just feel it on your chest. I have been there many times before. These guys were up against far more than that. And so what Peter is telling us, or actually not Peter, but what Scripture is revealing about Peter, is that he himself experienced the trials that we're talking about here, even more than we have. 
right? And so he experienced worry, doubt, loneliness, probably a lot of anxiety, as you know, just a few hours after Gethsemane, they came and he chopped off Malchus's ear. Right? That's what happens when you get when you're a man, I don't know when you're a woman, but when you're a man and you get really scared, you attack. And this is what Peter displayed. And so Peter having experienced that, he's not minimizing the reality of our hurts, of our pain, of our suffering, our trials, the oppression. He's not minimizing that, right? Peter's been there and Peter is a realist. So he's not saying, "Listen, that don't hurt. Cut it out." He's not saying that. He said, I've been there, situations far worse than your own. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I'm saying, man, look up at the promises, right? And so he goes on to tell us why God allows the persecution now. So look up. We're not going to go into a bunch of details and focus on the stuff. I know it's there. I know it hurts. But I want you to look up because I want you to exercise your faith. And that's what he's talking about here. So... Why does God allow these situations? God is God. He can turn it on. He can turn it off whenever He wants to. But He allows it. He allows for sickness. Olivia's mom uh, was in the hospital last week. I think she suffered a stroke. And Olivia texted. us. She said, please pray. My mom was doing so well. And all of a sudden, this thing came out of nowhere. And we're praying for her. These things happen. Could God just say, hey, wait, get out of the way. And raise Olivia's mom straight up out of the hospital bed. You better believe it. Why doesn't he do that? Foreknowledge. So he says, you can't possibly know what I know because all of you are just human. But I want you to trust me and as you trust me, your faith is going to grow. So he's comparing it to purifying gold. The way a craftsman purifies gold. Anybody know how a craftsman purifies gold? I don't know how they do it now. Maybe it's different now. But back in Peter's day, they would get a pot, small or large, depending on how much gold they had. And they would put a fire under it. And they would get one of those old, like a billow, I guess it's called. They would blow air in there and it would heat it up. And if you heat up gold, first it begins to melt. And then if you heat it up some more, the dross or the impurities come to the top. And then the craftsman wipes it away and the process is repeated. And he heats it up. More heat now the second time. More dross comes up. And he, right? And the process might have three or four different, you know, cycles or whatever. How does the craftsman know when the gold is completely refined? Huh? The ancient craftsman would look over into the pot. And when he would see his reflection, he said, Oh, the gold's been purified. This is why we go through hot, heated, desperate trials. God is purifying us. He's increasing our faith. When do the trials end? When he looks and says, Oh, Jimmy Jam, you look just like me now. And we say, Thank God, because I think I'm going to die tomorrow. <laughs> Man, I don't know how much more of the trials I can take. But God will never give us more than we can handle. right? But that is why we go through these things. That is why in a church... Where you have mature Christians that know the word, that are studied, that are completely devoted. You're in a room full of courageous people. The cowards left a long time ago. It takes a lot. A, a good friend of mine, another old dope fiend gangster guy, Kilroy Royball. He'd been through a lot. We'll have him back one of these days. But he actually was one of the guys that started the Mexican Mafia. He is one of the toughest guys I've ever known in my life. And he shares openly about the fact that carrying a Bible under his arm is the toughest thing he's ever had to do in life. When you hear that from a guy like that, and I know his past, you say, you know, there's something to that. And so I've experienced that a little bit uh, myself. But being a Christian is not about being a coward. It doesn't work. They don't go hand in hand. You will have to be courageous. And little by little, that comes through the purifying of, uh, of your faith. So, um, some will question God. And I've done it. When you're going through these trials. And we'll say, I don't see anything good coming out of this. I've been suffering for a long time. This thing has been with me. My little boy Lorenzo, when he was, I think, four or five years old. 
he was, well, he wasn't, I don't even think he was diagnosed, but he had a thing where his body was, his immune system was attacking his body. And the doctor said, look, it's attacking his skin. When it begins to attack his internal organs, we're going to put him on chemotherapy. And my little boy on chemotherapy? Wait a minute, man, I'm clean. I'm a Christian. I go to Bible college. What are you talking about? My little boy is not going to die. And I had it out with God many times. This didn't go away in a day. I think we were with that for a year, about four or five specialists, several doctors, and nobody could do a thing for my son. These are the things that happen when we begin to question, how could this serve any purpose, God? And I'll tell you the, the truth, that at the end, before it was all over with, I questioned many times, does God really exist, or have I been made a fool? Because if He exists, how come He doesn't heal my son? What a great story it would be. Well, when people like Olivia, caught my, my son was cured, the doctors never gave him any medication because they didn't know what to give him. But the, spe the last specialist called us one year after all of that and said, well, she took a skin biopsy. She said, what I can tell you is that I still don't know what it is for sure, but whatever it is, it's gone. Just like that. So you know what that has done for me and for my entire family? When someone calls and says, my mom has had a stroke. We pray, but we know God is in full control. That's what that trial did for me. I see God, I believe in God in ways that the average person doesn't see or believe. There's other things that have happened in our lives as well. But this is part of the reason. And so if we're that way, when we question God through trials, we go to Romans chapter 8, 28, and it says, We know, as Christians, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. Question. Is it up on the screen? There it is. Does it say that we see or that we know? What does it say? Read it with me. Read it with me. Everybody. We know. That God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. Does it say that we see or that we know? No. We don't see nothing. <laughs> we know, right? And so, we may not see our trials working for us or that they're working in our favor, but we know that they are. And so if you bought one of our recovery Bibles back there, that Bible mentions the word believe 424 times. 424 times. And then Jesus deals with that issue in John chapter 20 with a guy named Doubting Thomas. Do you remember him? So Jesus told all the disciples, go to the upper room in Jerusalem and wait there. Something's going to happen. They say, oh man, let's go, let's go. And Thomas says, I ain't going. They said, what are you talking about? He said, come on, guys. We've been made fools of. He's dead. And the other one said, wow, we're going. And Thomas says, go. Let me know what happens. I'll be here. They go and said, Thomas, you missed it. What happened? Jesus showed up. Come on, man. So he says, look, Jesus says he's coming back again on this day. Why don't you show up? Thomas says, all right, I'll go. He goes and Jesus shows up. And Jesus addresses him and he says, don't be faithless any longer. Believe. He's talking to Thomas. He's, and Thomas says, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. But blessed are those who believe without seeing me. That's you and me. I've never seen him. I don't know if you guys I've heard some crazy stories. I saw Jesus. I'd never seen him. I wish I would have been there. I'd never seen him. Right? <laughs> So I don't know if they see him or not, but they say that they say, I've never seen him. And so I'll tell you this though, the real Christian experience, the real, the real McCoy, the real Christian experience is not about seeing to believe, but believing first and seeing later on. That's why there aren't so many people here. Can you imagine how many people would fill this room if Jesus appeared in the clouds for all of the city of Los Angeles to see? But it doesn't say, blessed are those who see and believe. It says, blessed are those who believe without seeing me. It takes faith. The Christian experience is not about seeing. It's about believing. So now, Peter writes about God's foreknowledge. This is heavy. 
that I'm going to give you right now a Bible college class. Thank God for those good professors because they helped me to see this. And they gave me a great illustration. Look at verse 10. 1 Peter. This salvation was something even the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, David, Zechariah, all these guys. Now remember, Peter's looking back. These guys aren't alive in his day. Peter's looking back to the Old Testament. This salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for you. For who? For you. They wondered what time or situation the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about. They didn't know what they were writing. The Holy Spirit took over. And they started writing what God told them to write. And when you read those Old Testament books, you say, how did this guy know? He didn't know. He was writing by faith the same way you and I, some of us, are living. Right? So he says, they wondered what time or situation the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about when He told them in advance about Christ's suffering and His great glory afterward. They were told that their messages were not for themselves, but for you. And now this good news has been announced to you by those who preached in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. It is all so wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. A lot of talk about angels today. You can go anywhere you want and talk about angels, but you can't go anywhere you want and talk about Jesus. Right? The angels that he's referring to here are angels. Yes, even angels, the Bible says, are looking. I don't know if they look from up, down, or if they're here. I don't know. But they're looking into how in the world is Mark A saved? That can't be. We know his stuff. We've been watching him. How does grace work into his life? In fact, he's Filipino. He should be in a Catholic church. (laughs) What is he doing in a church where they talk about the Bible? Angels are looking into this thing. You know why? Because angels have never sinned. And they're very perplexed about how people so wretched like ourselves could be saved by the work and the acts of Jesus Christ. Even the angels can't figure it out. You know why? Because we're talking about the very depths of the grace of Jesus Christ and God the Father. Right? And so what he's talking about here, what Peter is writing about, is what's happening to Christians today and in the days that Peter wrote this, that were foretold by the prophets 3,000 and 5,000 years ago. Right? And so... They didn't understand what it all meant when they were writing it. What didn't they understand? How is it that salvation will be for the Jews? They were all Jews. How will salvation one day be for Jews and Gentiles? And what is this thing they call the church? Do you know that you never read about the church one time in the Old Testament? There was no church. Ahuva, there were synagogues in the temple, weren't they? But no church. And if I wanted to be saved, I went and I got baptized, and I got baptized into the Jewish family. But as Gentiles, we don't have to do that anymore because a Jewish carpenter died for our sins and opened up the doors for us to walk right in with our Jewish ancestors. The prophets couldn't understand this. They were writing by faith, right? They couldn't understand it, but they had glimpses. And we're going to go over about two minutes, if you don't mind. This is heavy. I want you to think, follow me through. So, the prophets, read Isaiah chapter 53. They knew, they knew that Jesus, the Messiah, would come and He would suffer and He would die. They knew that. In Psalm chapter 2, King David, one of the prophets... They knew, we know from his writing, that Jesus would rise from the dead and appear in glory a second time. They knew he would come the first time and die. They knew he would come a second time. But look at verse 11, 1 Peter chapter 1. They wondered what time or situation the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about when he told them in advance about Christ's suffering and his great glory afterward. So they didn't know the time or situations between the time of Jesus' suffering and the time that He would come in glory the second time. Meaning what? 
Here's the way the Bible college professors and Eli and Brandon are about to enter into Bible college. Pray for them because they're going to suffer for it. <laughs> All right? I want to applaud too. And I want to hug you, bro. But I'm telling you, you're in for it. All right? Stay close. Because Satan attacks people. Satan doesn't attack people more than those people that are trying to pursue him to serve him. Especially in that capacity. I don't want to scare you. We'll talk after. <laughs> but here's what they're talking about. Here's what Peter's talking about. So these prophets of the Old Testament, it is as though they're standing on a mountaintop, right? And they are where they are, but they can see all the way across to the other mountaintop and what it will be in the future. And they say, how can this be? How can it be about anything other than the Jewish people? How can Jesus save people so wretched? Why would he do that? When will he do that? When will Jesus come the first time? And my goodness, look at the mountain over there. When is he going to come the second time? What they couldn't see, what they were not privileged to see according to God's will, according to his foreknowledge, what they, God did not allow him to see was the valley between the two mountains. It was in that valley of suffering. It was in that valley of trials, of chaos, of confusion. That Jesus was crucified, the church was born, and Gentiles believe, Gentile believers, if you're not Jewish, you're Gentile, came to believe. And are now, as we take our last breath, entering into God's kingdom. It was the valley of suffering that they couldn't see. Right? So... In that valley was the church, the Christians, the oppression of the church, faith, grace, salvation for both Jews and Gentiles as they place their faith in the work of Jesus Christ. We will never come to this church to slaughter a lamb, tear it apart, burn it on the altar and offer it up to God because the Bible says that the Lamb of God has already been given to us and He died for the sins of all once and for all. Right? The prophets were amazed. How could this be? Right? And so listen, because sometimes, and here's the application, sometimes we are like the prophets. We read and believe the promises. We believe in the rewards. But we don't see them in our life yet. You feel that way? We don't see them in our lives yet. Right? Why? Because there's a valley between our mountaintops. And that valley in our lives is a season. It's a span of time. I don't know how long you and I are going to be there. We walk through it independently and collectively. But there's a period of time that we're going to be in that valley. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a process. And it could be a week, could be a month, could be a year. And listen, some people like Father Abraham, they're not going to see it for their whole life. Do you know that Abraham believed and died believing, never seeing the promises. God gave Abraham a promise. He says, Abraham, I know that they're saying that you and Sarah can't have children, but I'm telling you, you're going to have children. They're going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand in the seashore. Abraham is 99 years old. Sarah is 74. And they said, it ain't happened yet. And God said, I know, but I told you I told you. Not only that, Abraham, but your people are going to have such a great pop. They're going to be so populated. I'm going to give them their own nation. And Abraham went to heaven to be with the Lord and he never saw it. But it is today. You have Jewish people. I believe there are 8 million now in Israel. Somebody said there's more Jews in New York than there are in Israel. But Abraham said, me and Sarah, we ain't had one baby, Lord. I hear you. I read the book. I believe there's a reward, but I'm telling you, we haven't seen it. And God says, no, but you believe. And you're going to be the father of believers. So if you're a believer, a Christian believer today, guess what? You are one of those stars. You are one of those grains of sand on the seashore because you're one of Abraham's children. Not everybody is. I hear these wackos say, we're all children of God. I've looked. No, we're not. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says if you're part of the family of believers who live by faith, that's your mark. That's your mark. Abraham is your father. Jesus is your savior. So, 
That's the span of time. That's our perp. That's our process. It's that valley of suffering. It's that valley of trials. And it's not so bad. It's nothing like what they were going through in Peter's day. But if you have God's assurance that he's working, he's planning your life, then your faith is being purified. And we don't see, we don't think, ah, maybe no. We know because all throughout the Bible, satisfaction, reward, and victory always come after suffering. If you've read your Bible through Genesis and Revelation, that process never misses a beat. Might be a little time, might be a long time. But when you get through your stuff, you're going to say, Oh my God, I can't believe it. From one day to the next, my little boy is not sick. No chemotherapy. He's not going to die. I can't believe it. From one day to the next, it's been a year, man. Or whatever it is that you've been praying for and going through that process. Now, some of you might be saying, I know, Mario, but you know what? I've messed up. I've compromised. You know, I, you know, God says I'm not ready for a relationship, but man, I'm looking. And sometimes I make the attempt. Don't worry. Abraham and Sarah ran off and had a baby with some other woman. I mean, there's stories. How about David? He go on and on. The Bible is filled with people that screwed everything up. But remember, God, Jesus, he put Peter's hand in his hand. Jesus wrapped his hand around Peter's wrist and pulled him up. Because Peter didn't believe. He took his eyes off of Jesus and he messed up. But Jesus pulled him out nonetheless. And that is exactly what he's doing in our lives today. I am going to tell you that if you don't like your process, stop cheating because you're prolonging it. Take the shortcut and just be obedient. And that's not to say that God loves you any less one way or another. But take it easy on yourself. <laughs> and do the right thing. Right? With that, let's pray because Mark has...